next up, a final speaker for the day. Uh, it's a real pleasure to welcome back to Creative Destruction Lab, Vinod Kosla. Uh, I think Vinod doesn't need an introduction here. Uh, most people here know, uh, know Vinod or know of Vinod, uh, but just for the few that might not, uh, he was co-founder of Sun, uh, the founder of uh, Coastal Adventures, and I will never forget, I still feel the sting of the introduction I made in 2017 where I introduced him that way, and uh, Larry Summers, the former uh, U.S. Treasury Secretary and former president of Harvard, uh, as I made that introduction, uh, waved from the corner and said, wait a minute, introducing Vinod Kosla as a venture capitalist is entirely correct in the same way that introducing Einstein as a physicist or introducing Babe Ruth as a baseball player is correct. Uh, so that was the scolding I got from Larry Summers. It's great to have you back, Vinod. Thanks, Sajay. <laughs> okay, can we advance the slide? Um, I want to begin here with an essay that uh, Vinod wrote uh, called AI, Scary for the Right Reasons. Uh, as many of you know uh, that Creative Destruction Lab, we have made a very significant bet early on, uh, starting in 2012, in machine intelligence, largely built on the shoulders of uh, what happened in the computer science department at Toronto. And now it's become a, uh, you know, a much broader, uh, broader endeavor. Uh, but I was, I'm gonna start off with, a, with a, a section from the essay, it's up on the slide. For background as a technology optimist and an unapologetic supporter of further development, in 2014 he wrote the massive uh, dislocation in society AI may cause and while our economic metrics like GDP growth and productivity may look awesome as a result, it may worsen the less visible, uh, but in my opinion, far more critical metrics around income disparity and social mobility. So Vinod, I want to begin with, you're making many investments uh, in AI-related companies, and so you are seen like the canary in the coal mine. Do you still feel, this is roughly two years since you wrote that essay, uh, that income disparity is, is one of the primary concerns of this technology? Even more so. And can you explain why? Um, so, you know, AI may be, and this is uh, not particularly radical, the most important technology we've seen in a very long time. Uh, some people call it the last technology we'll need because it'll invent all the other technologies we need. Uh, so it has massive potential for contribution. Having said that, where we get to depends on the path we take. And the path we take, and it's great to talk about Creative Destruction Lab, uh, if you're being destroyed, it isn't a lot of fun. Uh, it's great to talk in our entrepreneurial world about disruption. It's not great if you're the one being disrupted. Uh, it's always unpleasant for somebody. I think in this path from AI as a technology to AI as a contributor uh, to free up humanity to do what it really wants to do. And I would venture to guess nobody wants a job uh, doing garbage trucks or running a Uber taxi or standing on an assembly line. Most jobs that we covered as econo economists aren't jobs people really would do if they didn't have to do them. Uh, that is the long-term potential for AI, to eliminate the need of work. Now, long before we get there, we will go through the dynamics of adjusting from today's economy into that economy, where imagine a per capita income of a million dollars a year in $2010 or today's dollars. Uh, the path will be extremely uneven, and I think that will be the reason the world and society as a whole may push back on technologies. And, and I think income disparity is the most obvious reason. Uh, social mobility is a related concept. 
you know, further in the essay, you, you make the following remarks. You say, displacement may not happen to just lower skill jobs, uh, like the ones you just listed. Uh, truck drivers, farm workers, and restaurant food preparers may be less at risk than radiologists and oncologists. If skilled jobs are like, uh, like doctors and mechanical engineers are displaced, education may not be a solution for employment growth. Again, over the last couple of years, as you've watched uh, what's happened since you wrote the essay, do you, uh, you in, just in your remarks right now, you, you listed the uh, sort of lower skilled jobs. Are you still as bullish on AI uh, moving up the food chain to these higher skilled jobs? Yeah. So separating what has happened or can happen. Let me talk about what can happen. Radiologists are toast. They shouldn't be a job. I'll go even further to say any radiologist who plans to practice in 10 years will be killing patients every day and only be their arrogance that lets them practice because it'd be criminal because they'd be misdiagnosing much more than normal systems can. And I don't think it's, it's a be polite kind of thing. It'll be, you'll be causing deaths because you choose to practice. Uh, Oncology is also, no, though not many people have worked on oncology because the science is very fluid still, uh, oncology is much easier to automate than a factory worker because the factory worker has much more dimensionality. Um, uh, so I do think the higher skilled jobs, the more knowledge based jobs um, will make the will be the easiest to replace with AI. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't replace Uber drivers or factory line workers. And frankly, all of those are being attempted. And they will get increasingly more capable and sophisticated. All right, now I couldn't let the last. I, I do have to say one other thing since you brought this up. Um, I, I gave this talk uh, that was here in Toronto at the National Bureau of Economic Research meeting. And I talked about some of these things and Larry Summers came up after the talk and said, you just blew my solution, which was education, for how to counter AI. I, I actually think it's true. People do not realize why education is not the solution. Maybe training in uh, America's Got Talent and be a competitor there is a solution. <laughs> maybe exporting is a solution. Uh, maybe hockey is a solution. But uh, uh, I think people have misperceptions, but keep going. You mentioned hockey because everybody, when they're here, they think about hockey, but I suspect you might be a Golden State fan. <clears throat> I am a Golden State fan. I'm a bigger fan of the San Jose Sharks. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and then I won't even say anything about Golden State. <laughs> um, All right. So the next part, just the other part of this quote, I just couldn't let this one go by. Uh, if skilled jobs like docs and mechanical engineers are displaced, uh, education may not be a solution for employment growth. We're going to circle back to if it's not education, then what? Uh, but you wrote it's good for many other reasons. As is often proposed by, and the emphasis here is mine, simplistic econ economists uh, who extrapolate the past without causal understanding of reasons why. <laughs> so, you know, Vinod has done this multiple times where just at some point he throws a, you know, a rock over at economists. Uh, and I think in some domains that's fair. Uh, and uh, what I will say that with respect to AI, that, uh, you know, in, there's a famous meeting in 1956 in Dartmouth uh, where a bunch of computer scientists, a small group got together and effectively that meeting was the initiation of the field. And Vinod, you very kindly came in 2017 uh, where we had this meeting of economists. As far as we know, this is the first meeting of sort of, of significance of uh, some of the world's leading economists to uh, turn their attention to AI. And so just for the room, I wanted to point this out uh, that from that meeting that Vinod was at, that was really our Dartmouth. So Toronto 2017 for economists was there, was our Dartmouth for uh, relative to the computer science. Uh, Great uh, opportunity to throw rocks and darts. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Uh, and so this book just came out by the University of Chicago Press 
this is not a popular press book in the sense that uh, you know only if you're really into the uh, economics of this you might be interested. Um, but it's it is what I would view the first. You you made this point here: who extrapolate the past without causal understanding, and the whole purpose of the exercise here was to get at, at uh, some of the causality uh, underneath the 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 phenomenon that is driving artificial intelligence. Okay, uh, then in the essay, he goes on to talk about. Um, human motivation. And so he says, uh, we will not be able to address every social issue like human motivation that will surely result. Uh, capitalism is by permission of democracy. And democracy should have the tools to correct for disparity. I suspect that this AI-driven income disparity effect has a decade or more to become material. And so the question I want to ask here is, this field is moving so fast. And it feels like things that we thought five years ago would take 20 years, some of those things have happened in three or four years. And so given what you've seen since you wrote the essay, do you still think the income disparity crisis is a decade away? Or is it? Well, I, I, you know, there's many reasons for income disparity. Um, policy being one of the larger ones. Um, and we can come back to in what way policy is one of the larger ones. Uh, so. AI as a contributor to income disparity as the driving variable, and I do believe if you took 20 or 30 years out, it'll be the largest variable, not one of the variables. There are other variables uh, that are playing in. Of course. And obviously, politics amplifies some of these effects, and politicians use it to gush to, for personal gain in lots of interesting ways. Uh, so. The AI piece, I do still think, is a far away. Now, all of us may agree that AI in radiology is sort of a done deal, that there's nothing AI can't do that a radiologist can't. And it's a lot cheaper, it's a lot more accurate, it can do more things that radiologists can't do, uh, but, it, you know, Today, 1% of radiologists may be using these technologies. So there's a time period for rollout that's very important in looking at these. My bet is, before it's commonly accepted, we are 10 years away in radiology, maybe 15 years away in oncology, and say, we don't really need oncologists. Your primary care physician is the best physician to look after you because the specialty expertise of an oncologist and AI system provides it, and he can provide integrative care, for example. Uh, so that's just one example. So the rollout of technologies is different. Uh, how long before I take every prog uh, all the progress and what you can do on the assembly line with robotics? Um, I think we are probably five, 10 years away from being able to replace the human worker on assembly lines. By the way, probably the largest market in the world. A trillion dollar of revenue would be too small in that market. Um, and, and you may not see it directly. For example, take the assembly line worker. If you built the assembly line worker robot that didn't need programming to program them to do a task like assemble an iPhone. And that's key, because today we can program robots to do it. But if it didn't need programming, if it just learned by seeing a dozen examples and then actually did its work like an assembly line worker would, uh, you might see other effects. For example, that will result in inversion of the supply chain. I'm going off topic here which is all the manufacturing jobs that have moved to China may actually come back to the West because it's much more cost effective to have those functions local. So you might see other ways the system adjusts for a while. Uh, and, and so I do think rollout is, uh, is hard to predict indirect effects like the example I just gave you an inversion of the supply chain, frankly between assembly line robotics and uh, 3D printing, you might say a complete inversion of what is now called the supply chain. And so in, that, in the supply chain inversion, 
Uh, how does that change the time of delivery? Well, well uh, uh, it doesn't change the time of delivery. One, delivery always takes a long time to roll out. And politicians will try and maintain homeostasis uh, politically. And that will slow things down. Um, but all I'm saying is it may show up differently than you might imagine. That it may be Chinese workers being displaced and it's not visible in US economic numbers. Okay. Further in the essay, uh, so the, you know, the title of the essay is AI is Scary for the Right Reasons. I should have read this essay. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so these are, I would say, in the essay you touch on sort of three main themes of why people are scared of AI. So reason number one is AI is taking jobs and that results in the income disparity that you're talking about because basically the idea is it shifts a value from labor to capital. So the labor, the things we do with our body becomes less valuable uh, and the people who own the capital, the machines and the intelligence that's embedded in those machines uh, are the ones that uh, reap the rewards. The second area of that you raise in here uh, that I think well captures uh, something that some people are scared about um, is this notion that you say here, while much of the public discourse from the likes of Elon Musk and Stephen Hawking reflects on sci-fi like dystopian visions of overlord, AI has gone wrong, uh, there's a much more immediate threat. We're going to move to the immediate threat in a moment, but I want to touch on this one because you put in brackets a scenario, <laughs> scenario certainly worth discussing. I'm surprised you would say that in the sense that it doesn't feel like there's any evidence that there is any progress being made despite everything that's happened in deep learning that would make us think uh, that an, an AI overlord is in any way um, a result of advances in machine intelligence that we've seen. So uh, first, deep learning is not AI. Yep. Deep learning is one of probably a dozen components of AI. And I think one of the things, just as an aside, we'll see is understanding what AGI really is composed of. It could be just deep learning, very unlikely in my view, but who am I to know? Um, there's better people. But there's so many others, probabilistic programming, graph, pro uh, theory. Um, you, you're seeing a new module of intelligence show up or new type of intelligence show up very frequently now. So my working assumption, it can be wrong and won't affect my uh, end result conclusions. There's probably a dozen types of intelligences that will constitute what we start to say AGI, or at least AGI that replaces most val economically valuable human functions. And that's sort of really the metric that causes society to not need jobs. Valuable economic activities that AI can replace. Um, having said that, this is, these are going to be very complex systems. In complex systems, in general, and it doesn't matter whether it's the US economy, whether it's Windows software code with however many millions of lines of code it has, Complex systems have holes, bugs, effects like the Lehman bankruptcy in 2008, the financial crisis. These are all the nature of complex systems because we can't fully characterize them. And so they do have the possibility of unintended effects, and we use that term often. I do think that exists in AI too. Having said that, I'm generally positive optimistic that we can contain the negative effects. By and large, my view is every really powerful technology is a powerful tool that can be used for good or bad. Could be about, you could do it with nuclear. You could do it with biotechnology. You could do it with CRISPR. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, um, I, I do think this, Danger exists, but it's not a reason to stop progress. Uh, when you refer to AGI, uh, general intelligence, it's not 
narrow and very task specific. Do you suspect in terms of who will get there first, open AI, deep mind, somebody else? Um, it's very hard to tell. Um, so we are, in fact, uh, we are probably the only venture investor in open AI. Very large check for us. Um, and I don't think we've ever otherwise written a $50 million check, which, was, uh, which is publicly our investment in open AI. Having said that, the small company working on assembly line robotics called Vicarious, which is also developing AGI, not using deep learning types of approaches. Um, and I could describe other such efforts. I have far less visibility into what's going on in China, for example. There's clearly national focus on winning the AGI race. Um, DeepMind is clearly doing some stunning work, and there's other efforts within Google. Um, I'm generally optimistic that one of these technologies will win in a big way, but more than one will win in doing more and more of the economically valuable human functions that we need done, which is what's key to eliminating the need for work for human beings. Right. Okay, so the three key themes in this essay, one is uh, in terms of these, the downsides or scary sides of AI. One is jobs, one is, is you know, the Terminator, and uh, the third, which really is the theme of the essay, in other words, this is the main point you drove towards in the essay, um, was this one. Uh, long before AI goes uncontrollable or takes over jobs, there lurks a much larger danger. AI in the hands of governments and our bad actors used to push self-interested agendas against the greater good. Imagine an AI agent trained on something like OpenAI's universe platform, learning to navigate thousands of online web environments and being turned to press, attuned to press an agenda. This could unleash a locus of intelligent bot trolls in, onto the web in a way that could destroy the very notion of public opinion. Alternatively, imagine a bot army of fo phone calls and so on. Um, and well, in fact, I'll read that one given that we're heading into a federal election. It's, uh, it's worth thinking about. Uh, um, from the next evolution of Larry Bird, uh, with, uh, with unique voices harassing the phone lines of congressmen and senators with requests for harmful policy changes. This, this danger, unlike the idea of robots taking over, has a strong chance of becoming a reality in the next decade. So, first of all, it seems to me that the, probably so far, the most successful commercial use of machine intelligence has been for persuasion and that is through targeted advertising. And if that's true... Brexit being a classic example, the US election, of course, but Brexit is the most visible example where it actually probably changed the outcome. So, I don't think that we have, have really thought through in terms of the um, you know, public opinion as a focus area for technology. Uh, in other words, that link I don't think has been uh, as salient as it is today in any dimension. To what extent do you think that um, the application of machine intelligence to influence either public opinion for something like an election uh, or much more micro behaviors uh, is a first-order threat? Well, so let me clarify two separate things. The question you asked and the question I addressed in the essay. Um, historically, if you look at the world, I can, uh, I can develop in my country a better economy than your country, or I can just develop powerful tools, and once you develop a powerful economy, I go take over your economy. Like, this is why invasions happened in the past, why Napoleon did what he did, why the British Empire did what it did. It took over places and extracted resources. Um, cyber warfare, powered by AI, 
is one of the most powerful weapons to take over what traditionally would have been very visible attacks on other countries. Now, most of us find it hard to imagine a nuclear attack because you can't do it silently. So, other technologies like a better air force, better nuclear bombs, uh, they had transparency when you were developing them. You couldn't develop a nuclear bomb without others being able to verify it, so you could actually have a huge treaty. You develop nuclear, uh, you don't develop it, I won't develop it, and we'll verify it. In AI, there's no verifiability. So the notion of contracts and treaties does not exist when verifiability doesn't exist. Uh, would we trust the North Koreans on Kim Jong-un's word that he won't develop nuclear? Well, we wouldn't. We could trust him on nuclear because if he violates it, we could verify it. That's not true in AI, and that makes it a very surreptitious weapon for cyber warfare. So that was one of the essays, uh, one of the issues I was saying that this issue of AI and cyber warfare in the battle between nations because it can be done silently and without transparency is a danger I worry about more immediately. What you're talking about, I also referred to in my essay. Now, in that time, the presidential election meddling and Brexit meddling hadn't happened, but I anticipated it could happen. Um, we do have the ability to hack the, any human mind if we have enough interaction with it. That's what's happening on Facebook when somebody sells you a pair of jeans you didn't think you wanted. Right? You're reverse engineering a narrow part of somebody's mind, making them do what you want them to do that they didn't know they wanted to do. The simple version of it is sells more stuff to more people. The hard version of it is to get you to vote a certain way. Um, those are real dangers. Um, I don't know if there's easy solutions. There are good parts of it. I actually think 10 years from now, you won't be listening to music. You'll be listening to a song composed for your brain that has the right resonances in the right brain circuits. And it'll, it'll be a very different version of music. Somebody should do a startup to do that. We do have a startup to produce a top 10 music hit that has no humans involved in any part of it. Um, I, I'm, in, I'm intrigued by these edges of technology. But there is that danger. Okay, so I'm going to uh, open for a, a couple of questions, specific people who've been in, an, in our AI stream, in particular uh, Barney and Sally uh, and Titus, who uh, offer them a chance to ask a question. Uh, but before I do, um, with regards to this threat, because of the three threats that you raise in the essay, and certainly uh, in terms of what we've been doing at the lab and the interaction we have with a variety of different communities, policy community, user community, entrepreneur community, and the, of course the computer science community, that this one, uh, you know, all three are ones that come up, but this one feels like it's, it's definitely the most imminent. What do you think that we should be doing that we aren't currently doing? Well, first thing I'd say, we aren't doing enough of investment in AI despite the dramatic increase. The potential benefits are very large. But, but that's only a matter of time it will happen. I do think the thing that would help the most is social adaption. Conditioning people for the consequences of this and how to roll it out where the least disadvantaged aren't disproportionately affected, hopefully they're most positively affected. Now, there's been some notions and talk around universal basic income. Um, I think there's some really good ideas in that. 
that will make adoption of new technologies much easier. And so, as you, as you, as you know, total human benefit, whether you measure gross national happiness or gross national product, can increase and a lot of people still be disproportionately negatively impacted. I think looking at the mechanisms for not having that happen or compensating for that adjustment. For example, Bill Gates at one point talked about a robot tax, a tax on every robot. Uh, you know, in, in the environmental movement as carbon reduction has been a key goal. People have talked about carbon taxes that disproportionately benefit the bottom quartile of society. Uh, uh, those kinds of mechanisms, I don't think we are studying enough. So making adjustment easier and less, and, have, and having fewer negative consequences for the people who are most disadvantaged, I think is very important. So the, the example solutions that you referenced in response to this threat, while the technologies coming from the tech world and the incentives to build these uh, are coming from business, the solutions you describe are all government. Uh, universal basic income is government. Robot tax is government. Uh, each of these feels like it's a government policy response. Is that your your sort of overall uh, assessment of the, the risk posed by these are really the job of government to protect uh, society against them? Well, so I, like everybody else, hate government solutions because they get engineered to narrowly benefit somebody once you look at individual words. I never would have believed it till I got involved and said, after midnight, one word changes, dramatically shift the benefits, at least in the US, of any legislation. And most of those happen in hidden back rooms and one word changes um, in, in very oblique ways, uh, with money playing a large part of that. Uh, so policy is great theoretically to talk about. Right policy is seldom done. Um, so I don't know the answer. Uh, I do think there are non-governmental solutions. In, or there may be other solutions that change the playing field. So let me take capitalism. It's a philosophy we all buy into, but why was capitalism important? It increased economic efficiency. But, and, and that's been very, very important, and you can look at North Korea and South Korea and see the difference of what economic efficiency does. Having said that, when we move from an era when efficiency is not the key goal, because efficiency in production is going away as a major variable. Capitalism today is more about generating demand, making you want things you didn't want, than about producing the things you do need. Uh, there's a fundamental change in that equation, and that may change even further. You could change the playing field of how capitalism works. When you say we allow, and I'll use a US term, an MLP, a partnership tax structure, you're advantaging certain kinds of activities and disadvantaging other kinds of activities, you're tilting the playing field. I've long believed that not having an R&D tax credit in the United States, but having capital depreciation advantages incumbents because they have assets to depreciate and startups are mostly just uh, technology startups, especially just need R&D tax credits, not Depre faster depreciation. So every single pol uh, policy tilts the playing field of capitalism. I do believe we need to relook at that, and that can be done in the academic world, outside of government policy. Okay. All right. Uh, so we give have you a new task to do. Yeah, that's right. That, because I don't have enough. 
Uh, I'll work on that. Um, let's start with Barney. Uh, if you, you can start up if you ha have a question. Any, it doesn't have to be on this, it can be whatever you like. Okay, hi Finad. Uh, great, great to see you here and, and fun to have this conversation. Um, so I guess one question would be, like talk about OpenAI. So OpenAI said that they're, they had this valuation, and sort of they, they committed to somehow like was a hundred billion dollar, not to sort of exceed a hundred billion dollars return to investors because that would just be too much. Um, that seemed like a lot of hype to me. Um, that was a very sort of uh, audacious statement. And also your investment in them, you know, I guess I don't know what the actual valuation was really, but that was a large investment. Um, I'm wondering, are you thinking about this as largely binary? Basically, if AI, if someone makes AGI, it's just kind of uncountably valuable, and so really valuation doesn't really matter, it's kind of binary, and if it doesn't, it doesn't really. Is that, is that how you're thinking about it, or how? Um, I actually don't think of it as binary. I, I think uh, instead of calling it binary for the scientists in the room, I think there's economic value that will be generated no matter what, when that many people with that much resource are concentrated in one place working on one problem, you will generate value. But there's some reasonable probability that a phase transition will happen where you get into, it doesn't matter what the valuation was. So there's sort of a pre-phase transition uh, 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 you'll get a storm and winds and, 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 and then you might have a phase transition where it becomes a typhoon or you have a wave turn into a tsunami and those are nonlinear transitions and I think that's the probability distribution of scenarios I would look at. But you, you, think, there, you think there's kind of a floor on the value, it's just going to generate value because of the team anyway. Well, and there's so never a floor in the investments, I wish there was. <laughs> Uh, you're always taking a risk. Uh, but frankly, um, uh, there's a Harvard Business School case where the top line is a quote from me saying, my willingness to fail gives me the ability to succeed. I do not believe innovation's possible in a risk-free environment. And the more social net we provide for entrepreneurs, and speaking to all the entrepreneurs in the room, so that the consequences of failure aren't catastrophic. Your kids can no longer go to college. Uh, the more innovation we will see. Uh, okay, uh, where's Sally? Uh, does she, oh, okay. Uh, so we go to uh, Titus and then Ramez. So my, I'm Richard Titus, we've met before. My question is actually more systemic and less AI, if that's okay. So I, I know that we both share a real strong passion for sustainability and, and curing some of the, the societal climate change ills on the planet. And as I was listening to you talk about the incentive changes around AI and investment in startups, how can we take some of that same thinking to our planet? Or, you know, as Buckminster Fuller calls it, the spaceship Earth. Well, <laughs> you know, this is an area where we've spent too much time on what should happen not what will happen. So I'm very passionate about sustainability, but most environmental organizations have done a very, very good job of identifying the problem, and they've done more damage than you could possibly do in coming up with solutions. You know, most coal plants in the United States that exist, that have been built in the last 30, 40 years, were built because of some environmental organization uh, opposing nuclear. If we had moved to nuclear the way we should have, and if the cost of nuclear, the cost of capital for nuclear hadn't gone up through the roof uh, because of the risks the environmental organizations associated with nuclear, we'd have cheap nuclear power. The reason nuclear worked in France is their cost of capital was so low. It was governmental cost of capital at two or three percent. I can justify any capex investment and the marginal operating costs are so low. So that was a cost of capital issue and a risk issue. Uh, 
I don't think we've spent enough time working on fundamental technologies uh, to change the economics of car low carbon technologies. So give you two examples. Uh, I'm very proud we just got started a fusion project out of the MIT fu plasma fusion lab. It doesn't have the nuclear waste problem. I don't even consider it a nuclear technology. It doesn't have a weapons problem, doesn't have a proliferation problem, doesn't have a waste problem. Have we invested anything in it? No, not really. Um, take geothermal. It is, you know, if I talk to you, anybody in oil and gas here? A few people. You said, well, we'll drill in 5,000 feet of water, and I said that to you in 1990, you'd say, you're crazy, really hard problem. If I said to you in 2015, let's drill in 50,000 feet of water, you'd say, easy, right? Technology has progressed. If we did 5,000 feet, I should probably be using metric units, uh, I grew up in the metric world. <laughs> uh, um, but do 10x the depth in geothermal? Every coal plant in the US or Canada could be repowered with geothermal power if you went to 50,000 feet. You wouldn't have to go that deep. If the, you only need one thing, the cost of drilling doesn't go up exponentially with depth. If it was linear, you'd solve the problem. But nobody's working on the problem. So we haven't focused on the right solutions and we generally haven't looked at deep technological solutions. Uh, we, it may be where we now need to focus on it because we, you know, most people now admit we aren't going to solve this problem without carbon negative technologies, not carbon neutral technology. So direct air capture is being talked about for the first time. Geoengineering is being talked about. Uh, those need clearly new technology. So I don't know if I answered your question. But I do think technology is the most important solution to that. I'm still inspired. <laughs> uh, by the way, there's all, it, and this applies in every area. Eight years ago, there's probably two things I did that people thought were crazy. Uh, one, I wrote my first AI blog. It was uh, 2011. I said, do we need doctors? And eight years ago, people thought this was like so loony, it didn't even need it to be responded to. But the other thing we did is in invested in a hamburger company, Impossible Foods. People thought, what's venture capital doing in hamburgers? Uh, and I made the point that technology applies to every area. And we can talk about some of the fun areas I like now. But that one technology has far greater impact. And most case tests prove the burger from Impossible is indistinguishable from regular hamburgers. But it will do more for the planet than electrification of transportation or cars. Uh, in terms of carbon reduction potential. Just explain to people who aren't familiar with Impossible. Impossible is a burger that, uh, that's not, that made from plants, not from animals. Animals are highly inefficient, depending upon whose numbers you use. You need three to 4,000 liters of water per kilogram of meat on your table. Uh, you need 15 kilograms of feed, those kinds of numbers. Uh, you can free up 80, so 30 to 50% of the planet's land area is dedicated to animal husbandry. If you did direct conversion of the same food, so not cause people to change their taste, they still love a great hamburger, you could free up 80 to 90% of 30 to 50% of the planet by just one technology. Replace animal-based production of meat with other ways to produce the same taste, flavor, nutrition, everything. So there are opportunities in every area you can think of 
People always challenge me on this, and I challenge anybody to ask me in, about an area that I can't come up with some way to uh, <laughs> radically change. Uh, Ramesh. Benaru, great to have you here. Benaru, great to have you here. Back on AI, there's this uh, storyline that happens in both AI companies and AI science fiction of the Terminator takeover, which is all about uh, winner takes all or winner takes most. The first person to get to a certain point uh, sort of dominates forever, and that shows up in the Terminator and in and, and sci-fi, but it also sort of, I sense that in sort of the valuation discussion and the size of check you're writing in OpenAI, but when I look in the AI field, I see the, you know, in ImageNet, the worst place team uh, was better than the best place team of that year three years later, and so I see people actually drafting, I see the techniques getting out there or uh, similar techniques being developed how do you see this? Is, are most of these AI companies really in a winner-take-most or winner-take-all model, or is it going to be a lot of competition? Uh, I, I'm personally hopeful there'll be a lot of competition. Obviously, Google and DeepMind doing great work. Uh, there's a whole ecosystem around Toronto. Uh, OpenAI is doing great work. There's work going on in China, mm, and there's probably other efforts we don't know about. I mean, you know, most people don't know vicarious is taking an AGI approach uh, to uh, uh, assembly line robotics. Uh, so I'm hopeful it'll be more distributed and more competitive. The tr benefits to society will transfer faster. I do think antitrust laws do need to be adjusted over time to avoid the winner-take-all phenomena in economics. Technology-based development tends to have winner-take-all economies. Uh, Ted, please. Okay, this works. Um, I, I agree with a lot of what you said about the potential of AI, the impacts on humanity and society. Um, what I'd be interested in is, let's if we fast forward 10, 20, 30 years, however much time it takes, and one, AI has taken over the vast majorities of jobs in the world, but good news, two, we have universal basic income, so everybody's okay. And so now we can all sit at home and do whatever we want. Um, I think for a period, you know, the question is like, what will people do for a period, you know, we'll watch Netflix and we'll play computer games and then we'll say, okay, I'm sort of done with that, what should I do now? Have you thought at all about it, just be curious, once we get past that first point, what will people do, the majority of people do, to find meaning in their lives? So um, you ask a very important question. This essay that Ajay was using was done in 2017. In Forbes in 2014, I did a very long piece on income disparity. And I ended that essay with the idea of the harder question will be finding meaning for human beings. And I can't speculate what that is, but if I look at what appeals to the human brain. Social functions do. So there's probably a hint in that. Uh, people like creating. And there's no question AI will create better art than humans can. But when my kid creates something, I like it more than the best artist does. The meaning is in who created it. You know, it may be this sketchy little six-year-old painting, but I still love it more. Um, I definitely keep it more than I keep some other painting. I value it more. So, uh, look, meaning will be an interesting question. I can't tell you, but uh, I do think we can get to a world where AI serves humanity uh, not replaces its core functions. But it does free up humanity from things like being at the McDonald's counter or at Walmart as a clerk. Right? Jobs people have to do, not ones they want to do. And some people may still love their jobs and want to do them. I mean, I could easily imagine a nurse wanting to do their job because I, every time I see a nurse, I'm just amazed at the conditions they work in and how positive they are about what they're doing because they're helping people. So there are hints, but I don't know if there's an uh, answer I can predict. 
I will say one thing to you. Most of these large complex cha changes, even if you can't predict what will happen, doesn't mean that will not happen. Some things are just better done knowing that you can't know than try to predict. I always say predicting the US GDP growth, you're better off saying I don't have a clue uh, and maybe next quarter will be like last quarter is the best you can do. Uh, and in fact, if you look at quarterly projections two or three quarters out and map them against error rates, the error rates are greater than the projections. Uh, if you start with 1960 on, um, or something like that, I s um, I've been wanting to do this analysis. My point is, a lot of important things are not knowable, but you can still plan for it. You don't need experts who are extrapolating the past to tell you what will happen, because they're most likely wrong. Okay, my last question, uh, Vino, for you, and then we'll wrap it up, is, uh, several times in this conversation, you've talked about various companies, you've talked about it with respect to machine intelligence, and then you've made a very quick reference to China, and then you've moved on to other topics. Uh, Kai-Fu Lee makes the argument in his book that uh, he's anticipating a shift in the, in the geopolitical balance of power, largely as a function of AI, uh, and China's ability to train AI models as a, f as a result of not just the amount of data, but the scope of data that some of their large companies have that dwarf the scope of a Facebook or a Google or an Amazon. How does the presence of China influence the way you allocate capital uh, in, in the early stage investments you make here? Uh, so one, I don't let the presence of China impact what investments I make. But let me make one, a couple of important comments here. I do think the country or the culture, I, I refer to cultures, Western values cultures versus other cultures. Uh, the culture that wins the AI battle will have a huge advantage in all other war, uh, wars like the economic war. Now maybe there'll be enough for everybody and so we won't have to have a war. And, and the optimistic scenario says people will move on to other more valuable things than whose GDP growth is the highest. Um, I actually think that's reasonably likely at some point, though it's hard to believe. Um, so, but there will definitely be a period where the strength of the AI technologies in related technologies, you know, CRISPR and gene editing and biology and treating biology as a digital world with circuits where you can program anything, uh, including possibly intelligence, which won't happen in Western culture, most likely, but might happen in China, um, engineer intelligence. Um, there's so many areas we could talk about. That's going to be an important battleground, and I hope Kaifu is wrong. Um, he also is making a rather simplistic assumption that I completely disagree with. I suspect strongly that the most important AI technologies won't rely on what Kaifu is relying on, which is lots of data. In fact, probably the single largest advance we need is learning from sparse data, learning from a few examples. You can teach a human being to assemble an iPhone by doing it three times, not by 300 million times. Now, that isn't the nature of deep learning technologies, but there's plenty of people working on those kinds of technologies uh, as alternatives, and they're very, very early in their development, so not yet publishable. But though there are efforts to do that, and so this whole notion of data, I'll expose everybody's personal data so my AI can be stronger than yours, may be just a false assumption. It may allow for certain things like pattern recognition better than if you didn't have data, but it may be like uh, semantic understanding doesn't need that that 
building concepts and knowledge and coming up with the next physics theory uh, doesn't need that. So I'm hopeful we will progress beyond data is the only way to make progress in AI. 